a uh, very good afternoon to one and all and on behalf of the national academy of sciences india delhi chapter and the india lupardhya college university of delhi i would like to welcome our esteemed panelist dr n nishad fatima and my co panelist uh, dr sachin mittal and dr vinod kumar who are faculty members and department of chemistry in india lupardhya college in this special public webinar which is organized under the aegis of the dvt star college program and it's also a part of uh, the azadi ka amrit mahotsav uh, series webinar series which our college is hosting over the next 4 uh, to 5 months today we have with us dr n nishad fatima who is a senior principal scientist in organic and physical chemistry laboratory csir clri rdr chennai and she'll be talking to us on the topic wealth from waste towards environmental sustainability so before inviting dr fatima to deliver her talk i would like to introduce the speaker to all the attendees she is a principal senior scientist in csir central leather research institute and holds a btech mtech and phd degree in leather technology from anna university chennai she is a gold medalist at both undergrad and postgrad levels and a recipient of dad fellowship dr fatima's work is focused on protein assemblies and has made significant contributions on use of ionic liquids in the stabilization destabilization process of collagen Her work on biophysical studies on collagen has led to development of biomaterials and value-added materials from proteinous waste. In recognition of her contribution, Dr. Fatima has been awarded the prestigious INSA Medal for Young Scientist, INAE Young Engineer Award, IEIE Young Engineers Award, Sir Women Excellence Award, Nayudama Young Scientist Award, and Fellow of Madras Science Foundation, and many more. She is a member of Enyas and Young Associate of INAE, and has about 110 research papers in international journal of repute, six book chapters, Indian patents, and U.S. patents to her credit. She has visited several countries, including U.S., Germany, Ethiopia, Greece, Spain, Turkey, Japan, and Brazil, for delivering invited talks and lectures. And she delivers popular lectures to school and college students. under the inspire program of dst and chikyasa program of csir so with these words i invite dr fatima to kindly deliver her talk thank you for your kind words of introduction professor manoj saxena uh, let me now share my screen is it visible yes a uh, very good evening to one and all present um let's begin from the beginning you know it's the uh, uh, way we start our presentation today talking about waste now what is basically waste you know the uh, the garbage or things which we don't require which we throw it off basically right and if you see these pictures you will see that ha ah, ye to hota hai it's all when it is collected by the corporation or municipality and it is put in a particular place right so this is the typical garbage dumps is what you would think but can you imagine like we are ending up per day 4.7 million tons world over and we as india also contribute a huge share in this when we talk about tons remember each ton is in thousands of kilograms so like we are talking about a huge quantum of waste now the question will come okay these are waste let it be so but what would happen to the planet earth if we continue to leave these waste well these cartoons depict it all one fine day probably not very you know long in the future uh, this cartoon says here you might have to put a post uh, like you know a poster or a picture of the green trees Uh, when you have cut all the trees and uh, this cartoon clearly says you know one probably one nation says you don't dump in my shores the other nation says you don't dump in my shores uh, but they less they realize that you know even if you dump in the so called international waters it is going to diffuse into their countries or nations as well and uh, this boy over here you could see that 
uh, you know, he's saying, uh, he's asking his father, what do we have for dinner? But the money is not going to be eaten, right? And this cartoon clearly tells us, these are all the issues, right? We understand the problem now. But this man is holding his placard saying, someone do something about these issues. And when he looks at his daughter, the answer, you know, she gives is, I'm looking at someone who, who, who's that someone who's going to solve this problem. See, we always think someone else will solve this problem, but we forget that it, the onus is on us as well to solve the issues. Now, if when we talk about environmental sustainability, this picture clearly tells us that, you know, uh, to convert this garbage into this so-called earlier times, how the earth looked into a greener environment, we definitely need to do something to make this environmental sustainability and can we be that someone is the question which I'm going to pose to the audience sitting over here. For instance, if we take the plastic waste, uh, we all know that we drink water from bottles and eventually throw them off. But you could see from this pictures here that these are the uh, few, I'm not saying these are the, the only way, few ways of trying to reuse those bottles in a different way, right? So similarly, this is one such example. I'm just giving you one example of one item which we use in our everyday life, how we can recycle or reuse them in different forms. Typically, a water bottle is used for drinking water, but you can think of really innovative ways, you know, to make this as typically a wealth from waste product. Now, being a leather technologist, I would vouch for the fact that the leather itself is actually a waste of meat industry, which we are converting it into a value-added product. Skin is not so edible. That's why it is thrown out of the meat industry. And once it is thrown, you might think, you know, ah, let it be wasted, you know, let it go to the environment. Actually, when it goes to the environment, it will cause more problems than actually converting it into a leather. And by converting it into a leather, you're not only solving the environmental problem, which would be created if I let to degrade that skin, but I'm also doing a value addition and I'm getting a very much value added product from this uh, skin, which is converted into a leather. So hence the putrescible hides and skins are now con getting converted in the form of a non-putrescible leather. And this is one industry which actually connects a rural farmer to the fashion world. If you go back and see, like, you know, uh, there are many industries which have so many products which they make, but this really connects somebody who's rearing a sheep or a goat, you know, in his house, in a farm, uh, in a village to the fashion world. So to that extent, uh, leather connects people. And just to give you a flair of, you know, what are the different types of products which you can manufacture using, Using uh, leather, you have handbags, shoes. Here, I have given only the ladies' shoes. Trust me, you can also make men's shoes. And uh, you have garments. And many may not know that industrial application of leathers. You know, these are the uh, consumer applications uh, which I have shown earlier. But there are a lot of industrial applications like the belting leather, the textile loom leather picker, and a huge market is there for the harness and saddle. The what you put in, you know, on an uh, horse. Uh, these are all still traditionally made using leather and there's a huge market for that. And there are some special type of leathers, you know, uh, we call them as uh, uh, shamoy leather, wherein uh, you can use this for oil filtration as well as you can polish your diamonds using this leather. In fact, uh, if you go to a jeweler and he wants to make his diamond, you know, shine, this is the typical, not a synthetic cloth. This is the material which you will use, the chamois leather. So you have you know, different applications of leather. For instance, these, I think, you know, one, everyone will recognize the gloves, bells, the watch straps, uh, leather watch straps, they're all famous. Now, I said that leather is a waste of meat industry, right? And I am actually doing something good to the environment by converting a waste product into a bad value-added product, fine. But in this process as well, for instance, if I take uh, like one ton of you know, raw hides and skins being processed, 
actually i will be converting only about 200 to 250 kilograms as leather almost like 700 kilograms goes as waste because you can imagine like you know if you have a animal skin you know imagine animal skin you will have the hair on the top and you will have the flesh on the other side but you don't find them in the end product right so those are all materials which are unwanted in the final product and which get removed during the leather processing and that contributes to the solid waste so now when you have an industry when you are making a value added product you don't want to end up generating waste as well because in that process again you are affecting the environment so what we are doing at uh, clra is trying to find potential use for that waste as well and one such waste is a fleshing waste like as i said the top layer of the skin will have the hair the bottom layer will have the flesh so that flesh amounts like 120 kg for every fiber skin which are processed we have tried to find an application for this fleshing waste it can be done in several ways because typically a fleshing waste what does it contain it is again a protein plus fat plus water of course now on the other hand you also have the liquid waste and this is not generated only by leather industry in fact you would definitely a uh, effluent or the common problem of a textile industry you have so many colorful dresses garments which are made and they are the main polluters of uh, dyes and chromium 6 again it is not present in leather industry because we use only chromium 3 for tanning and chromium 3 is uh, not a toxic or a carcinogenic agent it is only chromium 6 which is a carcinogenic agent and so on one hand we have a solid waste which is coming out of the leather industry particularly the fleshing waste which we are going to discuss now and on the other hand we have the liquid waste in the form of dyes and chromium 6 now what does uh, mathematics teaches 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 i'm sure everyone will agree with that now you have two problems one a solid waste another a liquid waste so when i combine two problems together Do you think you'll end up with a solution or a problem again? But we went ahead in trying to actually solve this problem by converting this fleshing, which I said earlier. Also, it's nothing but a proteinous material, basically collagen, and it has the carboxyl group. We have many functional groups. One such is the carboxyl group. So we coordinated it with the metal ion iron three plus to make it a cationic iron three complex, and this was. useful in binding the anionic form of your chromate so thus we found a solution for the liquid waste as well as this worked for the dyes as well the metal uh, based dyes or any dyes which are you know used generally in textile as well as in leather industry we found an uh, efficiency of about 95% of dye removal this picture tells you that you know how clear the solution becomes but have i actually solved the problem i have treated the liquid waste i have removed the pollutants present in the water right but this has gone into the so called fleshing waste that's the solid waste so i haven't solved the solid waste problem yet so what we did was we used up this adsorbed the proteinous material uh, it is used as a reductant in the manufacture of basic chromium sulfate which is a tanning salt which is used in leather industry and we made leathers out of it and we clearly saw that by combining two problems a solid waste with a liquid waste we ended up resulting in a tanning salt which again went into making of leather hence an efficient and effective way to manage the solid waste is is emanating actually now the other application which we thought you know we could use the fleshing waste was to actually prepare a rubber sole as i said this is a proteinous waste right so when you convert this proteinous waste you you know uh, you can make it into an activated uh, carbon and uh, this activated carbon can be used for multiple applications you you know typically activated carbon is one of the best adsorbents for removing pollutants but here we thought we will use it for a different application that is for making a rubber sole usually for the manufacture of rubber soles people use carbon black as a reinforcing material actually it gives abrasion resistance and as well as the color to the sole 
Now, in, the carbon black is considered to be a carcinogenic material because it comes from such a source, the petroleum-based industries. And the use of this carbon black in the rubber industry is that they blend it with this rubber and they make the uh, rubber which can be used for different applications, including the soles. Now, what we did was we converted this activated carbon and blend the fleshy waste into activated carbon and blended it with rubber and made these soles. And lo and behold, we have 100% value added material. Now, what are the benefits like by doing this process? For the tannery, which is where the leather is made, you don't have to worry about the fleshing waste disposal anymore. And the tanner can now actually gain revenue out of it. Instead of actually worrying about how do I dispose this fleshing waste, he is getting money out of it. And of course, you're solving the environmental pollution problem. Now, what are the benefits for the rubber industry? Because this product is getting converted into a rubber, right? So what is the advantage for the rubber industry? It, use, it avoids the use of this carcinogenic carbon black. And it's usually when you walk on a carpet, you know, with a black uh, sole, it will leave an imprint if the pigment is not sitting properly there. But this activated carbon which we used did not leave any imprint on the uh, carpet. So which means that it is superior to others and it gives you a good vulcanized rubber. And in fact, uh, I would say that I don't know if you're able to see it, uh, the experimental leather is what we uh, you know soles we made is actually blacker than the control black can be in different shades as well right and uh, this is uh, the highlight in a newspaper about our uh, eco friendly uh, you know footprint about our conversion of uh, waste into a value added material and uh, not only this you know we prepared a composite sheet using this fleshing weight you know we didn't do anything we just made a composite sheet and uh, you know, when you make jackets, these jackets will have this uh, stiffeners, you know, which can also be uh, one of the applications for this fleshing base. Now, we thought of a uh, different application. See, one was as an absorbent, as I said, for removal of liquid waste. One was to convert it into a rubber sole by making it into an activated carbon, using it as a compost material as a stiffener in different forms. And another application, what we thought was, can we use it as a sound absorbing material? Like we basically, what we did was we know that light, solid, liquid, and pollution, noise is also considered as a pollution. So in order to uh, circumvent or to avoid this problem, we thought, why don't we use the solid base to solve the noise, noise pollution problem? And basically what we did was we converted this into nanofibers. And we all know that nanofibers have the advantage of having a larger surface area to volume ratio and they have high porosity, which is essential for absorption of sound. So what we did, we converted this fleshing waste into a nanofibrous material by blending it with some polymers because as such, it is not electrospinable. And uh, we found that the sound absorption, if you see this red uh, you know, curve here, the sound absorption for the fleshing based uh, composite nanofibers was much better than the uh, conventionally used uh, material. And thus, you could see here that from this kind of a waste, you can develop several value-added products like the shoe soles, jackets with stiffeners, and the nanofibers. And, uh, you know, uh, as an adsorbent, which I explained earlier. So basically, one should always remember, remember uh, the cartoon where I showed you uh, that girl is looking for that who is it? someone who will solve this problem. That someone has to be us, me, who could every single individual who could contribute towards this environmental sustainability because it is ultimately one earth we have and it has to be protected. And what is the take home message? Well, uh, let me, you know, tell this in a story form because I know, you know, uh, kids love hearing two stories. So let me tell you a story of uh, two smart or one smart uh, frog. Uh, a group of frogs were traveling through the woods. Two of them fell into a deep pit. Helpless, deep thinking. What could be done now? Idea. Let's jump out like the humans do. The other frogs around started shouting, don't do that, it will hurt you. Hit your head and simply die 
we will of course miss you take the party this one you know desired to hit his head on the rock and he died poor guy while the other one continued to jump as hard as he could and once again the crowd of frogs elbowed him to stop the pain and just died he jumped even harder and finally made it when he got out the other frogs said did you hear us the frog explained to them that he was deaf he thought they were encouraging him the entire time so what i'm trying to convey here is if people tell you you are one individual one person how will your efforts or your uh, you know contribution going to make a change or a difference to this entire world you know this whole world how one person can make a difference please do not listen to them because you can make a difference and to just explain that i'll just play this video here and i'll ask you a question after this just watch it carefully ha huh? so what did you understand from this video this person i i hope you all recognize him he is one of the most famous football player ronaldo all he did was to remove the coke bottle from his you know in front of him and said aqua he didn't say anything else he just said aqua i don't know if you you know about him there well that cause the uh, coca cola company a simple action of just moving the bottle from there to you know down cost the coca cola company 4 billion dollars one single day's crash of worth of their shares so that is the power of one individual do not listen to people who say that how can you you might be a, you know i don't know uh, the audience i'm told this school children so probably 9th 10th i don't know which class you are in but you might think i'm a small child you know there are so many adults in this world or so many people in this world how can i contribute but then this is what is the power of an individual you can make the difference so believe in yourself what does this cat see you're not a cat you are a tiger so it all starts with you and uh, i would just end this saying that the future is full of surprises and unintended consequences and thank you all for giving me this opportunity i would like to have more time for interaction so that you know if you have any specific uh, doubts to be clarified i would love to do that so thank you for your patient here Yes, Professor uh, Manoj, do we have any questions? Yeah, let me let me just let me just check. Sachin, uh, can you oh, yeah. take up certain questions which uh, are here? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fatima, for talking about this topic, environmental sustainability. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Now, the first is, uh, what is uh, producible and non-producible? Okay. When I say producible, it means it is. biodegradable like basically uh, when we talk about any proteinous material right uh, if i don't do anything to it and leave it as such like say like i know a piece of skin if i leave it on my table and come back uh, like after a week it will not be there because it would have got putrefied okay it would have got it would have been eaten by the bacteria it would have become biodegradable so that is what we mean by uh, putrescible so basically that material is getting converted into a non putrescible or non biodegradable leather which lasts for a lifetime you no know, lasts for generations so that is the conversion which we talk about from putrescible to non putrescible the second is uh, i suppose the uh, audience want to ask should we throw away the things made of leather or are these materials uh, for, sorry uh, your your voice is not very much uh, audible i think uh, the author the uh, audience want to ask should we throw away the material made of leather 
or can we recycle them? Yes, yes, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, in, uh, many people think that, okay, skin was a problem. We converted into leather and that's a value added material. But after the usage of leather, you buy a shoe, you use it for two years, three years, and no, even if it is not torn, you would like to replace it, right? Because, you know, it would have gone out of fashion or for whatever reasons, you want to buy a new one, right? So when you throw this shoe into the garbage, right, it again ends up with the environment and you have intentionally made a leather non-putrescible or non-biodegradable. You converted a putrescible material into non-putrescible, right, or non-biodegradable. So this shoe is going to remain in the environment for a long time. So now people are talking about making these materials to also become biodegradable. That is, they are talking about making biodegradable leathers. That is, under certain conditions, after the usage of the leather, whether it's a handbag, garments, shoes, whatever, that should also become biodegradable so that it does not harm the environment. Another question is, can we control the microplastic pollution in the water? Ah, place? the best think... way to control the plastic pollution is actually not to use it. Because uh, I think many people have you know talked about this particular issue and uh, i think the only solution long term or feasible solution could be that otherwise the other uh, solution could be trying to use that product for a long time like as i said what is the usage of a bottle you use it for drinking water right but if you can convert this for some other usage and use it for a longer time than just you can just gulp a liter of bottle and just throw it off in a minute or five minutes, right? Instead of doing that, if you can use it for a longer period of time for some other application, then I think we still have a case, right? But otherwise, I'm not an expert in microplastics, but yes, it's a big challenge and a problem. The other question is, what are nanofibers? Nanofibers, ah, okay. Uh, I said that, okay, do you know what is nano? Uh, I mean, if the kid has asked it, they should must be told uh, what is a nanometer, right? See, the advantage of going smaller in size, okay? We all understand one centimeter, right? You have a scale, you can understand what is one centimeter. So when you go down and down, 10 power 9 minus 9 meter is one nanometer. What is the advantage of going down in scale? When you go down in scale, the surface area increases. Okay, and that is a huge advantage, all right? In fact, many catalysis reactions or many reactions, you know, can happen uh, over a large surface area and a better porous material. So these nanofibers are nothing but in the nano dimension, which I mentioned now, and they are extruded as in the form of a fiber, okay? So that is what is called as a nanofiber. It will not be visible to your eyes. You can't see them unless you have a... Uh, SEM or a, TEM, a microscope basically to see these fibers. Uh, uh, the next is uh, if, if the material is biodegradable, then won't the processing material causes greater harm to the environment? That means no. Why? Because as I said, for instance, as I, when I was talking about the skin case, if I didn't do anything, okay, if I didn't do anything to the skin and just left it you know, as such, because people are not eating skin, that's why it's a waste, isn't it? Skin is a waste of meat industry because it is not eaten by people or human beings, it is being thrown out. Now, if this material which is thrown out is left as such in the environment, what would happen is that will lead to more problems like generation of BOD, COD, the gaseous emissions. Imagine if something, you know, is putrefying, you'll get the smell, right? So right from the gaseous emissions to uh, soil pollution, everything will happen. So it is, it is actually advantageous to convert this into a leather than to actually let it degrade or putrefy. That is why I said in the beginning itself, it is a waste which is getting converted into a wealth. Some questions are still there, but I think they are not relevant for this particular topic. So I'm leaving these questions. And I thank you on behalf of Nasi and BDU chapter.
and i think we can compare these this method as a green analytic green chemical method now in green chemistry what we do is generally we say we recycle we make use of the waste material available in the same way here also we are able to uh, use the waste that is generated that is bound to generate during this process so thank you ma'am on behalf of the college thank you the thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh, dr fatima and uh, this is in succession of the uh, the series uh, the next speaker i think dr ganesh has already joined and uh, i welcome dr ganesh yeah hi so uh, we are continuing with this program for another 30 35 minutes of another interesting talk by dr b ganesh Oh, is be is again a principal scientist at electrodics and electrocalysis division CSIR Central Electrochemical Research Institute, Tamil Nadu, and uh, he'll be talking to us today on the topic electrochemical science and technology, a viable and efficient solution to global issues. And before inviting Dr. Ganesh, let me briefly uh, introduce him to the. attendees he is currently working as a principal scientist at CSIR Central Electrochemical Research Institute in Tamil Nadu and a gold medalist in undergrad and postgraduate course in chemistry after completing his master's degree he went to Raman Research Institute to pursue his phd in chemistry post phd he uh, in the year 2006 he then moved to united kingdom to do a post doctoral research at university of edinburgh and he also went to canada to avail a visiting researcher fellowship to carry out research work at university of manitoba canada for a period of 6 months where he worked on the area of nanomaterials for electrocatalysis liquid crystals and electrochemistry with applications primarily focused on biology and catalysts overall he has more than 100 publication in internationally reputed journal and contributed two book chapters and is a recipient of prestigious csir young scientist award in chemical sciences for the year 2015 and several other awards he has delivered many invited lectures across india and other countries like japan canada and uk and his research interests mainly include electron transfer studies electrocatalysis self assembled monolayers microbial fuel cells scanning probe microscopy catalyst electro analytical chemistry nanomaterials and so on so on behalf of uh, the national academy of sciences india daily chapter and the india lopatai college i would like to welcome dr ganesh to deliver his talk yeah you may kindly share your screen sir sure sir yeah uh, so thank you very much for your kind introduction uh, thanks for inviting me as well uh, let me take a minute or two to share my screen yeah <clears throat> I I hope now my uh, uh, yeah you can put it in the slide show yeah. yeah yeah and my voice is audible as well I guess absolutely yeah okay sir. thank you yeah uh, so uh, very good evening to all of you I know at some places it is good morning uh, first of all I would like to thank uh, uh, you know uh, the organizers. Uh, National Academy of Sciences Delhi chapter along with uh, Dean Dayal uh, you know Bhatiaya College uh, uh, affiliated to University of Delhi for providing me an opportunity and uh, uh, share with you guys you know uh, what I work on for the past 10 12 years or so uh, I would like to thank especially uh, Professor Manoj uh, Saxena for taking effort uh, in organizing this uh, webinar series <clears throat> okay so uh, today i'll be uh, talking about uh, electrochemical science and technology a viable and efficient solution to global issues so let me start by saying you know uh, initially uh, i would like to talk about where do i come from and a couple of motivational uh, slides based on nobel prize and then i will talk about what are the global issues uh, we are facing currently and what we will face in the upcoming uh, let's say about 10 years or so 
and subsequently i will provide solutions uh, through electrochemical science and technology maybe a couple of examples and finally maybe uh, you know i will uh, conclude my talk with some fancy ideas let's see how it goes okay so uh, <clears throat> so basically i come from an institute called uh, central electrochemical research institute which is profoundly known as sikri which is which is located in the uh, southern part of tamil nadu okay and it is one of the constituent laboratory of csir council of scientific and industrial research we do have two different sub units the headquarters is located at karaikudi and we have units at chennai and uh, uh, units at mandabam we are roughly about 300 employees and uh, one third of them are scientists even now sikri is one and only research institute in india completely devoted to the field of electrochemical science and technology okay we do work on uh, we do work on looking at fundamental aspects of electron transfer reactions across the interface to material design uh, to uh, instrument and prototype device fabrication for target applications etc so in a way we do a kind of multidisciplinary research approach and apart from this i would like to highlight here because you guys are from uh, uh, schools we do have a unique course which is uh, btech in chemical and electrochemical engineering okay and if you look at the history behind establishment of sikri the foundation stone was laid in the year 1948 by uh, then prime minister sri pandit jawaharlal nehru ji and it was declared open in the year 1953 by uh, then president sri sarvapalli radhakrishnan and a person who is standing right next to him is uh, uh, sri bhatnagar you know uh, dr bhatnagar he was the man behind establishing csir as a whole and uh, in between the two a person who is standing is dr aram alagappachetti he was a well known philanthropist belonging to this part of india thanks to him he has donated 100 acres of land and 15 lakhs of rupees in 1950 itself to establish a institute like sikri okay so uh, it's been uh, seven decades since its uh, inception and during the inaugural function sir c v raman was there i hope you guys know the moment i say sir c v raman there would be many concepts which could strike you guys okay uh, during the inaugural function sir c v raman has posed such a question what are these laboratories going to do unless otherwise the workers in this laboratory feel that it is up to them to do their very best otherwise these laboratories will remain as a giant question mark in the sky of course he was a physicist he was looking at the sky so he he in fact posed such a question i'm sure if raman would have been alive today he would have been more than happy to see what sikri has contributed both towards uh, you know building up of nation as a whole and towards the fundamental concepts uh, in the field of electrochemical science and technology i can cite many examples a uh, very visible example could be you know the main land of uh, 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 indian land connected to island rameshwaram through a, a bridge which is bomben bridge you guys should have heard about it the corrosion prevention coating for such a, a bomben bridge was provided by sikri and uh, you know uh, we have developed many iron selective electrodes and there are many uh, metallurgical processes for defense related applications etc sikri has contributed over the years and the recent addition uh, to this achievements is the establishment of make in india uh, uh, facility of fabricating 100 cells of lithium ion battery in india that is established at our chennai unit uh, 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 here right so why i talked about raman well we all know that we do celebrate science day every year on 28th february in order to commemorate the discovery uh, made by raman you know in order to commemorate raman's uh, discovery he discovered uh, raman effect and revealed to public on february 28 1928 for that he received the nobel prize in physics uh, in october 1930 okay and uh, this is uh, the quant spectrograph what sir c v raman has used to visualize raman effect and in fact he has delivered a famous lecture at rri raman research institute bangalore 
uh, on March 16, 1928, and demonstrated Raman FI to uh, public. The person who is standing next to him is uh, nothing but B. Krishnan. He is uh, Raman's first PhD student. You know, he has also contributed uh, to uh, uh, discovery of Raman FI. Okay. Why I talk about Raman? Yes, uh, he is the motivation behind many of us to take up science as a career. I'm sure you guys would have heard about Nobel Prize. For those students who do not know what Nobel Prize is all about, it is almost equivalent to Oscar what we get in you know, cinema's field. Now, during every year, second week of October, Nobel Prize winners would be announced. Nobel Prizes are announced usually to six different fields starting from uh, physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, literature, economics and peace, okay? And the actual uh, award ceremony will happen in a place called uh, uh, Stockholm in Sweden on December 10th or 11th, where the Nobel uh, laureates would be invited to deliver the lecture. And if you look at the history, there are many Indians who received the Nobel Prize. Here I have shown the photos. Rabindranath Tagore was the first Indian to receive Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913. And Sir C. V. Raman was the first Indian scientist to receive Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in the year 1930. Hargovin Kurana for Medicine in 1968. Mother Teresa for Peace in 1979. Dr. S. Chandra Shekhar for physics in 1983, Amartya Sen for economics in 1998, Venkatrama Ramakrishnan for chemistry for the year 2009, and Kaila Satyarthi for peace in 2014, and the final addition being Abhijit Banerjee for economics in 2019. If you look at from science point of view, among uh, these people, Sarsi V. Raman, in my opinion, was the one and only scientist who was carried out all his research work in India, and for that work, he received the Nobel Prize in physics in 1930, okay? So this is a kind of motivation one would get to take up science as a career, because there are a number of problems to solve, a number of you know, uh, issues to be resolved. So science and technology provides a unique opportunity to provide solution to this problem. Of course, uh, thanks to Professor Sakshana, he was reading uh, my bio data, of course, Basically, I'm a chemist. I do take concepts from uh, material chemistry and biology to come up with sensors and devices, mainly for energy and environmental applications and for uh, biomedical applications. Okay, so uh, to understand why uh, you know, uh, scientists are involved in doing research, it is essentially to find solution to these global issues. If you uh, look at this slide, here, uh, uh, it has been listed down the top 10 problems which humanity will face in the upcoming 50 years or so, okay? Starting from energy, water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism and war, disease, education, democracy, and population, etc. And if you look at uh, these things, of course, all the 10 issues are very, very critical. I can give examples for each of this. Let's let's see those uh, you know solutions to these issues in the subsequent slides. Energy, for example, you know, uh, maybe uh, two twenty uh, years or thirty years ago, uh, we don't had even mobile phone. Okay, if you want to call your uh, you know relatives or parents if you are staying outside, we need to use a you know trunk dial, a dial you know STD calls and make a phone call. But now if you see. We do have uh, uh, each and every person have minimum of two mobile phones nowadays, right? Or two SIM cards rather. More than that, uh, you take any house in village, okay? Any house in village without the following three items, uh, no house in village exists. For example, mobile phone, TV, and a two wheeler. So how do you basically provide energy for all this? And uh, uh, India is planning to, uh, you know, uh, uh, use all the vehicles as EV, electric vehicle by the year 2030. So we need to come up with an alternative fuel uh, to replace, uh, you know, petrol, for example. And uh, if you take disease, for example, I don't even have to talk about it. You guys have, you know, uh, experienced the effect of disease over the years, right? 
and uh, how do you find solutions to this problem that's the big question mark we do have at present now apart from this the human population across the globe in 2012 was estimated to be 6 billion and it is expected to grow roughly twice by the year uh, 2050 or so so how are you going to provide them let's say green energy good and clean drinking water healthy food cleaner environment for them to live etc how do you find solutions to this that's a real question mark now when you find solutions by making a little bit of a uh, step towards identifying uh, solutions to this issue and we would realize the dream of uh, self reliant india you know we would realize the dream of our honorable uh, prime minister sri narendra modi ji that we would establish a really self reliant india now when i talk about this is of course uh, the two areas i would like to highlight here is on about energy and healthcare let's take for example you want to find a solutions to a disease how do you go about doing this these are the uh, you know some of the basic steps one would follow to find solution to this you need to identify the root cause behind uh, uh, such a disease then you can understand the chemistry by your problem i'll give an example for this okay and you investigate what is the bioorganism involved in this and uh, you can understand the structure property relation then you come up with your uh, uh, method diagnostic method you testify your hypothesis so that you finally end up with uh, you know healthcare diagnostics for a target disease the one and only way to provide solution is through science and technology right when i talk about chembio interface why this thing is important you guys just think about it you don't have to answer uh, right now let's say we all have a uh, good food at night let's say good dinner and you go to sleep right who ask you to wake up in the morning maybe disturbance from your brother sister parents or mobile phone let's say we wake up okay once you wake up you get ready in a couple of hour or so and after that you feel hungry right so why do you feel hungry let's say you again have a good breakfast and the moment you take your breakfast you uh, uh, let's say you go to uh, catch a bus to go to school or college etc so when you go to uh, you know bus stop by looking at someone you feel very happy by looking at someone else you feel very much irritated right rather you would express your emotions why why do all these things happen in a broad way you would say that there is a biochemical reaction it's a very very fundamental way of looking at it right there is a biochemical reaction which occurs in our body that induces such kind of uh, 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 you know uh, uh, emotions now i would go one step ahead and say that when we talk about biochemical reactions there are certain biomolecules or enzymes for example that can undergo uh, either an oxidation or reduction so during this process there is an electron transfer reactions involved in these reactions right so whenever there is an electron transfer reaction associated uh, uh, with uh, biochemical reactions or for that matter any kind of reaction the study which deals with such, uh, such kind of electron transfer reaction it is nothing but your electrochemistry okay now you can broadly classify uh, the areas in which electrochemistry deals with into two categories the first one in which you can apply a voltage and drive a chemical reaction and the second case where voltage is generated because of a inbuilt chemical reaction we can uh, look at example for each of these cases in the second case for example let's say we do have wall clock or you know uh, battery operated uh, any kind of equipment the moment wall clock stops what do we do we simply replace a battery uh, replace with battery right so when you replace a battery the moment you connect a new battery the clock starts working why does it happen well because of the inbuilt chemical reactions which are associated with the mate- uh, battery material that gives a voltage output we will look at it in detail maybe in a minute or two where does the voltage in fact originates from okay so that is the kind of uh, reactions where because of the inbuilt chemical reaction it provides a voltage and that could be used uh, uh, for uh, uh, carrying out a chemical reaction 
Now in the other case where voltage is supplied to drive a chemical reaction. I'm sure you guys should have uh, read in uh, recent newspapers that water could be used as a fuel. Can we really use water as a fuel to drive vehicle? Okay. If you look at uh, the you know, chemical thermodynamics behind uh, such reaction, it is not a allowed reaction, meaning water cannot split on its own to hydrogen and oxygen. If you look at uh, water splitting reaction, H2O goes into hydrogen and oxygen. This reaction is a uh, thermodynamically not allowed reaction. So delta G, for example, what is delta G? Which is a Gibbs free energy. Delta G of that reaction is positive, which is non-spontaneous, right? But on the other hand, if you apply a small voltage of let's say 1.23 volt, water splits into hydrogen and oxygen. So that both could be used as a fuel to drive vehicle. In a way, what do we do is we establish a method through which you can alter delta G. If you look at Gibbs free energy equation, that is delta G is equal to minus N of E. In this reaction, N is the number of electrons which is involved in the reaction. F is Faraday's constant and E is the potential. For a given process, these two parameters are constant. And the only variable parameter is E, meaning potential. So by playing with potential, you can in fact tune delta G from non-spontaneous to spontaneous and vice versa. That is the uh, advantage of electrochemistry where you can carry out many reactions which are not possible in uh, normal chemical group. Okay, I, I have deliberately given this the figure from Google because the moment you type electrochemistry, you would get such kind of images in Google. Why? Uh, uh, because it establishes an electrochemical cell. What do I mean by electrochemical cell? Well, we do have an anode and cathode dipped into an electrolyte like a, a solution, right? And that establishes an electrochemical cell. The other advantage is you can easily correlate the solid liquid interface, electrode electrolyte interface to a simple electrical circuit elements like resistor, for example, and capacitor, so that you can get quantified values of these parameters. For example, battery, you would like to maximize the capacitance as much as possible. And similarly, supercapacitor is another kind of energy storage devices, where you would also like to maximize uh, the capacitance value in the given interface. Okay. Uh, the typical size of this interface is of the order of nanometer. Okay, right? Uh, of course, uh, previous speaker, Madam, uh, you know, Dr. Nishant Fatima was trying to explain what's the size of nano, right? It's 10 power minus nine meters. <clears throat> now, even if you apply, let's say about a very small voltage of 100 millivolt within this nanometer level of separation, if you try to calculate the electric field felt at that interface, which is a very simple formula, meaning applied voltage divided by distance of separation. So 100 millivolt divided by one nanometer, it will give you 100 into 10 power six volt per meter. Imagine, which is a kind of very humongous value, you know, like a very, very high value. Even though you apply a small voltage of 100 millivolt, the electrode, meaning solid electrode, will feel as if it is 100 million times higher. That's why uh, it induces change in delta G, and we could easily manipulate the reactions as a whole. Okay. Uh, okay, it is uh, since I, I know there are people from 11th and 12th standard also here. Uh, we use an instrument called potentiostat and galvanostat which is easy to fabricate on a breadboard. For example, this is a typical physics uh, experiment one can carry out. Uh, in electrochemical techniques, what we do is, we basically apply a potential and monitor the current change due to uh, electron transfer reactions which occur at interface, what I explained just before, right? And in order to do this, we can use only a two uh, simple circuits, like one is an voltage follower based on ICs, operational amplifiers, like integrated circuit like IC. You can have voltage follower as one, 
and the other one is current voltage converter. So because of electron transfer reaction, there would be a change in voltage. And if you pass that voltage through a resistor, you can able to measure the current. So that kind of monitoring change in uh, current potential is very easy. That's why electrochemical technique are, uh, techniques are very powerful. When I talk about electrochemical technique, in fact, we can cover a whole range of spectrum. What do I mean by that? Let's say, I'll tell a, a small story so that you will understand what I am actually trying to talk about. Among you guys, someone has got a gold medal, for example, let's say during uh, their 10th standard or 12th standard. And during the award ceremony, that person goes to the stage and receives the medal comes to the other end of the stage, suddenly some of his or her friends go and talk to that student. You know, how many of you guys think that at that moment, that person would behave normally? You know, it is a very questionable thing because at that moment, that person would think he or she may be the one and only person in the world who knows the subject very well. But Please keep it in mind. That is a kind of momentary excitation, right? That is not a normal equilibrium state. But on the other hand, when that person goes to school very regularly, he or she may be very good obedient student to teacher, whatever the assignment or you know work uh, uh, it has been assigned, he or she would perform to its perfection and timely, or he or she may be very friendly, you know, helping each other, etc. That could be. That could be the real characteristic of that student. Okay. Now, <clears throat> on the other hand, during the excited state, it may be very difficult uh, uh, for that person to exhibit its real characteristic. The same concept could be extended to electrochemistry, where you can uh, the electrode electrolyte interface, rather solid liquid interface, will behave, uh, will exhibit its real characteristic at equilibrium. And when you apply a small potential, you can deviate from equilibrium with minimal perturbation, rather with minimal disturbance. And when you apply a large value of potential, you can deviate so much from equilibrium, right? Under all these conditions, there are techniques in electrochemistry. Using that technique, you can understand how the interface behaves. Now, when we talk about potential, I would like to highlight where does the potential originates from. I'm sure you guys would have studied in 11th standard physics, which is very similar to parallel plate capacitor model. Okay. The moment you dip any conducting rod into an electrolyte or into a solution at solid liquid interface, it establishes spontaneously two layer of separation of charges. Let's assume, for example, in the conducting rod case, we have a positive metal charges. And the corresponding negative charges would arise from the electrolyte solution part. So at, an, at the interface, you establish such a kind of spontaneous formation of double layer, two layer of charges. This leads to a parameter called capacitance. And capacitance is correlated with potential through an equation C is equal to Q by E. C is equal to Q by E. Okay, Q is nothing but the charge stored at the interface. In fact, that's where the potential originates in electrochemistry. And it is not possible to measure potential of a single interface. Rather, we would measure potential difference between two different interfaces. And that's where we use electrodes like, you know, reference electrode, for example, so that you can measure the potential difference between working or a test electrode with respect to reference electrode. Okay. It is like, you know, comparing, uh, let's say, suppose you guys would play cricket, right? Let's say uh, if you are a good batsman, how do you say that you are a good batsman, right? You need to compare with the standard reference, right? For example, for me, Sachin or uh, uh, Kohli, for example, or Dhoni, for example, would be the perfect batsman I know. So compared to him, how do you perform in terms of technique, in terms of, you know, uh, carrying out the pressure, when you walk into bed, every time they expect you to score 100, you know? So how do you perform? So such kind of comparison in a similar way, you need to compare with the reference electrode and measure the potential difference. In fact, that's where the potential in electrochemistry originates from. <clears throat> now, 
I would take rather about 10 minutes to highlight uh, uh, what are the solutions we provided for this issue. Uh, this may be a little bit of research oriented. So rather I would try to highlight the concept behind evolving such an idea. And I don't, uh, you know, dump you guys with, you know, uh, provide you guys with more scientific uh, 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 background behind this. Now, among various biosensors we have developed in our laboratory, this is uh, one is very unique. This is a biosensor for lipopolysaccharide sensing. Why this molecule is important? Well, uh, lipopolysaccharide, which is LPS, which is present in the outer cell wall membrane of the bacteria. Okay. Suppose if a person met with an accident, we would like to know whether that person would uh, you know, survive or not. Immediately, we will uh, take that person to ICU, intensive care unit. This molecule would provide information about our immune response system. Okay, this molecule would provide information about our uh, survival, rather how is our immunity works. So it depends upon the quantity of this molecule released during this uh, acute phase, we can basically predict whether that patient would survive or not. Okay, so initially it leads to organ failure. And ultimately, it leads to uh, what is called a septic shock, cell poisoning of the body. But if you look at the structure, recall in the initial slide, I talked about structure property correlation. This is one such example. Okay. If you look at the structure of this molecule, we do have, uh, you know, these are all kind of sugar moieties like carbohydrates, uh, glucose, example, that kind of sugar moieties. And we do have long aliphatic chain, carbon chains which is hydrophobic in nature, okay? And we do have uh, the functional groups like phosphate, et cetera. So what we did is we created bioreceptors for each of these components. As a whole, you can consider this as a, a different structure, different patterns. So we uh, created receptors, for example, using hydrophobic interaction, you can anchor this molecule on the electrode surface, okay? hydrophobic interaction. And we created receptors for this phosphate groups. And uh, this molecule is highly toxic because of higher negative charges which prevails over the surface of this molecule. When you add these bioreceptors to this uh, molecule, the negative charges come down. So, which is a simple electrostatic interaction. That electrostatic interaction could be monitored by measuring impedance of the system. You guys know what impedance is, right? The AC component of resistance is called the impedance. So you can simply monitor how the impedance changes during this binding process due to electrostatic interaction through which we developed a kind of sensor for this molecule, okay? So we come up with a concept called a complementary pattern recognition receptor. As I mentioned, this molecule could be assumed as a single molecule with a different structural pattern. And we created receptors for each of these patterns. Okay. <clears throat> now, in a similar way, if you look at it, we can also induce uh, uh, you know, uh, enzymatic reactions. For example, you guys would, uh, you know, when you guys play during the break, what do you guys take? You guys take glucose, right? When I was giving a lecture like this, at some point, one student said, uh, during the break, what do you guys take? I asked the question. That person immediately said, sir, we do take rest. I said, yes, <laughs> that is also a good point. Yes, people also take uh, rest during the uh, interval, right? You know, half time, for example. So we do take glucose. Why do we take glucose? Because it provides instantaneous energy. Recall Delta G, what I talked about. So glucose, uh, 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 undergoes a complete chemical reaction to give you 6 CO2 plus 12 H2O plus energy. That is the kind of energy we talk about. That's why we get instantaneous energy. And delta G of that reaction is negative. Okay. Now, <clears throat> an enzyme called glucose oxidase, of course, the enzymes are specific in nature, you know, that converts glucose to gluconic acid and you can enhance or modulate the enzymatic reaction so that you can develop such kind of variety of sensors, okay? So that based on that concept, we developed the many uh, interesting sensors for glucose, hydrogen peroxide, cholesterol, for example, et cetera, okay? 
the binding events were monitored using electrochemical technique as a whole because i mentioned current and potential could provide much useful information in developing uh, such kind of sensors <clears throat> among uh, many different systems we developed i would like to highlight one simple system where you carry out a normal electrolysis you know this is what you guys would have studied in eighth standard for example a simple electrolysis process you keep an anode and cathode at constant potential you basically carry out metal dissolution right oxidation process at anode so what we did was we have taken a graphite rod and you apply a constant uh, uh, current or potential by doing that the graphite gets dissolved okay and by cleverly playing with the electrolyte composition of the electrolyte you can basically uh, get you know what are called color emitting smaller nanoparticles they are called quantum dots okay light emitting uh, uh, smaller nanoparticles they are very fascinating because depends upon the size you can tune the emission color in fact that's what we did depends upon the duration of electrolysis and depends upon the composition of the electrolyte you can play around with the different color emits like starting from intense blue yellow green etc interestingly during this process we get a precipitate which is settled at the bottom and that is nothing but uh, a kind of reduced graphene acid you know like a graphite you guys would have studied about it's a layered carbon material in a similar way we can introduce a zero dimensional material called graphene okay so that could be used for example such kind of light emitting particles quantum dots for example could be used for bioimaging applications uh, you know and uh, the settled precipitate what i uh, highlighted could be used for energy storage applications like batteries or super capacitors okay <clears throat> now in this series if you look at it the recent addition being we moved from a classical electrode you know solid substances based sensor to flexible sensor you know uh, these are all nothing but a array of flexible sensors developed on overhead projector seat you know you guys uh, of course we do use now ppt slide to make a presentation when i was a college student what my teachers used to do is uh, they write in a uh, you know ohp sheet and they display uh, using uh, you know uh, ohp sheet so such kind of polymer material uh, you can fabricate array of electrodes on the ele uh, flexible substrate so we adopted a similar strategy to come up with a sensor strip for glucose and the pesticide for example and uh, we can extrapolate this to immobilizing these sensors on a fabric material why this is important well this is important because you can go from invasive method of analysis like using blood as a, a medium to analyze analyte rather we can use sweat uh, as a analyte to understand human health nature uh, sir uh, how long can i take sir manoj sir you have switched yeah on? another 2 two, two minutes yeah ah, okay uh, okay sir i'll wind up in 2 minutes yes thank you sure <clears throat> so uh, sweat is an interesting concept uh, the scientific term for sweat is called perspiration if we look at the constituent of sweat uh, there are uh, many analytes like lactate urea glucose etc so when do we sweat there are two conditions under which one uh, one would sweat one could be a thermal you know temperature difference and the other could be emotional changes for example uh, when you uh, when your teacher suddenly walks into your classrooms and say that uh, we will have an exam now so suddenly you guys would be you know excited and if you noticed some of uh, the students would start sweating you know that is due to emotional changes now <clears throat> these kind of array of sensors what i showed in the earlier side could be used to analyze multiple biomarkers like lactate urea glucose sodium na plus or k plus chloride etc simultaneously okay so that it will provide information about your human health conditions as well as we can extrapolate this concept to both uh, uh, you know for defense and sports applications for smart sensing what do i mean by that 
for example let's say recently uh, olympics uh, was concluded okay so previously when they want to check whether a person has taken you know uh, uh, unallowed substances rather drug or you know such kind of uh, substances how do we identify they collect uh, the athlete's blood or urine sample before the race and after the race and when they do analysis they would like to know is there any abnormal levels of the biomarkers right that is not good because normally uh, it takes a uh, very long time and by then that athlete would have you know got a gold medal and uh, got lot of sponsorship etc rather what we can do is we can impregnate such kind of sensors on the fabric and simultaneously monitor while the person runs you know so that you can uh, by adopting a biocomputing approach you can able to predict is there any abnormal levels in this bioanalysis by that way we can come up with you know smart sensing uh, for both the defense as well as uh, sports arena uh, so rather i will skip a uh, few slides and i will just end up uh, uh, by saying that yes <coughs> electrochemistry uh, you know is a kind of uh, uh, very simple but powerful technique where you can take concepts from uh, different uh, areas so that you can come up with smart materials and smart sensing approach what do i mean by that for example you guys are listening uh, to me uh, uh, for the past half an hour or so and you get bored you know what this guy ganesh talks about always you know nobel prize sir c v raman for example electron transfer reaction electrochemistry biosensor sweat etc so you got bored and you simply lean in your chair the chair understands that you are not interested so it converts into a sofa so that you can sleep aramse you know that's the kind of smart materials we talk about rather keep it in mind if the chair thinks that this is very important because you guys are in the beginning uh, of schools so you can take up science as a career to pursue so for that uh, this lecture could be very much useful in terms of healthcare diagnostics in terms of understanding energy issues etc so the chair can prick you so that you wake up and start listening that's the kind of smart sensing we talk about so in order to do that of course it would be better if we adopt a multidisciplinary uh, group effort so finally i would like to thank you all guys for patient listening once again i thank uh, the organizers for providing me an opportunity to share with you guys thank you thank you very much thank you very much dr ganesh for enlightening us i request my co panelist uh, dr sachin mittal who is a senior faculty in department of chemistry in the alupadhyay college to kindly take up certain questions which have been shared by attendees in the chat section okay sir let me just look at the chat dr ganesh most of the questions you have already answered if you wish you can again take up these questions one was one is uh, what is glucose metabolism i think this is a basic question if you want to answer want what to is answer. glucose meter is it sir yes sir okay what is glucose metabolism okay glucose metabolism very good yeah <clears throat> so uh, for example let me explain this based on a glucometer which is available in the market you guys would be seeing whether your parents or you know uh, grandparents would nowadays analyze the level of glucose present in blood serum using a glucometer so what do they do they simply prick your finger take a drop of blood put it on the flexible strip they provide you know and the moment you connect that strip into a device the device will give a reading so how does that work in fact the flexible strip has an enzyme called glucose oxidase which specifically converts glucose into gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide okay so the moment you connect that strip into a device the device is nothing but an electrochemical instrument what i showed a simple uh, you know uh, uh, pcb based circuit element where you can monitor how much hydrogen peroxide is produced during this metabolic process by either oxidizing or reducing okay so that you can correlate the amount of hydrogen peroxide directly to the amount of glucose present in the solution the metabolism what i talked about is essentially based on this process the enzyme glucose oxidase converts glucose to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide 
So that's the basic concept behind this. I, I yeah. hope you understand this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next is basic science question. I suppose is asked by some student. What is capaci capacitance? What is capacitance? Okay. What is capacitance? Yeah, I think you answered this in between. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I can repeat. No issues. Uh, I'm sorry, your volume was slightly lower. That's why I could not get the question. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Uh, so right. <clears throat> How do you describe capacitance, okay? Uh, if you look at uh, the slides, what I showed earlier, the moment you dip any conducting rod into an electrolyte, okay, when I say electrolyte is nothing but a solution. So at solid liquid interface, you would establish spontaneously a separation of layer of charges formed at this interface. Let's assume metal have a positive charge, and from the solution side, the ions would form a negative charge. So this formation of uh, double layer, rather two different layer of charges, positive and negative, will form a parallel plate capacitor model. Probably 11 standard school students would know about this. Okay, This establish a layer of separation of charges that leads to a parameter called capacitance. Okay. In electrochemistry, this parameter is related to potential through a simple equation C is equal to Q by E, where Q is the charge stored at the interface. In fact, that's the uh, that's where the potential originates in electrochemistry. Right? Yeah. Next is uh, what is potentiostat and galvanostat? Very good. Yeah, it's a very good question. Yes. <clears throat> when I in uh, if you look at chemistry as a whole. There are many different parameters we would have studied. For example, concentration, temperature, pressure, etc. If we look at electrochemistry in particular, in addition to these parameters, we do have two other uh, uh, parameters to play with. One is potential and the other one is current. Okay. When you say potentiostat, potentiostat is a kind of instrument which provides constant potential with respect to time. Potential meaning potential, static meaning constant with respect to time. Okay. On the other hand, galvanostat mean constant current with respect to time. Galvano meaning refers to current, for example. So this is the definition for potentiostat and galvanostat. When you talked about septic shock, students want to ask what is septic shock? Septic shock, okay. So when I was talking about uh, a sensor for a specific molecule called lipopolysaccharide, okay, I mentioned that this molecule is a potent immune response system. For example, uh, you can generalize for a mammalian system, this molecule would provide information about our immune response. Okay, depends upon the concentration level. For example, suppose if you get, uh, if you guys get a fever, for example, before for that it will provide some symptoms. You may have some stomach upset or you may have a body pain or to start with you may have a headache etc. And ultimately it can lead to fever down the line. Similarly, in case of LPS sensing, depends upon the concentration of that molecule. Initially it can lead to organ failure. Maybe your hand may not function or you cannot walk, your leg may not function etc. And when the concentration of such molecules, the levels of such molecules increases in our body, it ultimately leads to septic shock, which is nothing but self-poisoning of the body. Complete failure of organs function in our body. That is called a septic shock. One is an interesting question. The student yes. is asking, can we use the biosensors uh, can the parents use biosensors for detecting if the child is addicted or not? <laughs> Beautiful question. Uh, in fact, this is what I want from my lecture. I don't want you guys to you know uh, understand the hard chemistry behind it. Rather, you take the concept and think on your own. Excellent question. I can I can uh, comment this with a slightly a different answer so that you yourself would guess whether we can get this or not. Okay. Let's say when I talk about expressing emotions, you know, during the lecture, I mentioned about taking a good dinner, going to bed, waking up, feeling hungry, expressing emotions, etc. Why does these things happen? These things happen 
uh, let's say because of certain neurotransmitters we call okay dopamine for example i will only tell the name but you can uh, google it at a later point dopamine for example epinephrine for example uh, these molecules should be segregated so our former director you know maybe some of uh, the panelists would know dr vijay mohan and kp pillai he used to say that we can use micro electrodes you know electrodes of very very small dimension like that could be used to record ecg okay that kind of electrode you take and prick your brain cells okay prick your brain cells and by applying a small voltage you can control the release of such neurotransmitters so that a student can be completely made to focus only on studies don't divert to you know cricket or some something else so that the student can be made completely uh, to focus on studies alone so by that way you can basically control the release of such neurotransmitters and to answer your question straight forward yes <laughs> we can develop certain biosensors like i mentioned about this and we can you know without knowing to you we can impregnate on your fabric and using a mobile wifi we can track where you guys go what you guys do etc so in principle yes it's possible to do last question i'll take is can electrochemistry increase the use of ai artificial intelligence precisely yes <clears throat> the whole idea of giving such lecture is to use the multidisciplinary approach okay electrochemistry is a kind of tool we can use to modulate the reaction we can bring about many changes but in order to read out for example i want to use let's say 100 electrodes simultaneously you know you cannot use for every uh, electrodes a separate circuit what i showed earlier so that you need to use 100 circuits to measure Uh, many different parameters at a given time rather we can use the ai approach so that you can uh, uh, within a fraction of minute or two you can completely read out the signal so you can adopt a multidisciplinary approach so couple the concept of not only electrochemistry i would rather say chemistry biology physics etc with the ai and we can come up with many uh, excellent devices in terms of biosensor particularly yes and there are people who already work on such kind of systems dr ganesh dr ganesh can i ask one question yeah uh, please very, please uh, very interesting uh, talk yeah. uh, i when you commented that you know if i use a sensor and put it on my brain and try to control it are they not making robots then instead of human beings <laughs> not trying to control the human uh, emotions or uh, no is absolutely it, uh, yeah. in the right direction <laughs> no you you got the point yes in fact i am not a supporter of such kind of experiments but what i uh, rather want to highlight is can you can it. you can basically control the release mm. it it may be useful for child with you know uh, many other disabilities for example they may have a less amount of uh, uh, certain neurotransmitters released so they may not function in a normal way but by uh, impregnating such kind of chip such kind of electrodes we can rather tune the release of such neurotransmitters so that we can have a normal function of the brain Hopefully i would i would i would rather answer a different way to a scientific community and <laughs> rather a different way to a student because i want them to only get excited and motivated <laughs> i hope you understand that yes thank, thank you. you thank you for asking question ma'am yes thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr ganesh and dr fatima uh, dr sachin dr vinod for being there with us uh, for this interesting these of two lectures and i also would like to thank all the students because after having a hectic day for their online classes uh, still they were there for uh, these two interesting webinars so on behalf of nasi delhi chapter and dean dial upadhyay college i would like to thank both the speakers as well as all the students thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you thank very you. much thank thanks you. for the opportunity okay. thank you thank you thank you very much thank you ma'am see you around thank you bye bye thank you bye I thank you all the student also for your patience listening thank you